So at this time, I'd like to graciously thank Police Credit Union for sponsoring uh, this lead series for over 65 years. The Police Credit Union has been providing financial solutions to take care of our own, exclusively serving law enforcement professionals and their family members throughout California. They proudly provide banking solutions, including checking accounts, home and auto loans, credit cards, online services, and more. As your financial partner, Police Credit Union is committed to helping you succeed financially, whatever your stage of life. So we thank Police Credit Union for being our exclusive one source community financial partner and for sponsoring this lead series and bringing the profession together. So let me say welcome. My name is Sean Rundle. I'm the deputy director out of CPOA out of our office in Sacramento. Uh, wearing multiple hats, liaising to uh, a lot of our volunteers throughout the state uh, wearing the, the lobbyists and legislative hats. So I'm seeing all the different reforms coming through. But one common thread is the need for a topic like this uh, pertaining to wellness, which was originally why these lead sessions were set up. They were created immediately upon the uh, onset of this pandemic so that profession could stay connected and share best practices on a range of topic with a focus on maintaining personnel motivation. So today's topic is certainly conducive to that. And again, this is truly meant to be a round table. So we look forward to hearing your ideas, solutions, uh, questions during this half hour. Um, so in addition to the COVID pandemic and, and recent nationwide headlines, you know, pivoting your community response, the law enforcement community has been struck by an epic epidemic, unfortunately, of police suicides. Uh, the recent pandemic plays certainly plays a part of this trend. So this afternoon's conversation is the Asher model, a seven point approach to a culture of wellness. And we're grateful to have Chief Neil Gang of the Panola Police Department, uh, who's taken time to share this story with us today and provide some tips for you to take back to your department. Uh, in speaking to the Chief yesterday, I know what will make this forum really successful is hearing from all of you. Uh, it's his goal, it's our goal. So please speak up, use your chat box for, for questions and comments. Um, which leads us to our first poll question to get things started off. We're curious to see how many folks uh, are used to uh, or have seen uh, the Asher model as part of the CPOA Cortico app. Um, or did you even know that there was such an app? So we'll give everyone a, an opportunity to, to respond to this, which will help us understand what you've been exposed to. So we have about 75% responses coming in. I'll give it another few seconds here. So there we go, about close to 40% of you have seen the app. Um, for those that haven't, uh, it's, or for those that said, oh, there's a CPOE Cortico app, it's good to know. Um, and for you to know that if you just go to the app store and, and start to put in CPOA, uh, you'll see CPOA Cortico on that app and in the Cortico blog, you'll see the Asher model is one of those components. And there's another, a bunch of different resources completely devoted to wellness within um, CPOA and Cortico and access to other parts of CPOA's website and things like that. So if you haven't been exposed to that app or weren't aware of it, uh, you know now. So we encourage everyone to, to download that app. So that gives us an idea of what you've been kind of exposed to at least, at least in terms of the app purposes. But for uh, this story at this time, I'll turn it over to, to the chief. And uh, again, thanks everyone for being here. So thank you very much, John. I appreciate the intro. And um, you know, it, it's such an important time and an important topic for us to discuss. And I'm happy to see that we have people from all over. Uh, I actually see some familiar names and uh, Javier, it's good to see you. And, uh, I know I've used you as a resource before, so it's really nice to have all these people here. I want to start out also by saying, you know, thank you to Sean, Alexander, and also Carol for this opportunity by CPOA that's given us this opportunity to have this critical conversation because it is very important. Um, I can say that I'm, I'm blessed and honored to be here with here today and to, to share with you um, something that we put together. It's a model that we think it's uh, fairly successful and uh, anybody's willing to take any pieces of what we bring out today and, and use it. Uh, there's no patent on anything, so feel free to use it and uh, make it your own and, and do what we do in law enforcement most, uh, most often. We, we cut and paste, put our name on it, and say we did it. So feel free to, feel free to be able to do that. Um, 
Certainly when I present, I always tell people that I'm, I'm presenting a way. I'm not saying this is the way or you need to do this. It's just a way. And uh, I hope that people have an open mind to understand uh, what may work for your agency, may not work for another agency out in California. I know we have some people from all over the country here, uh, Sean shared with me. Uh, so that's important to understand that. Uh, I know we only have a half hour today, so we'll kind of move this a little bit quickly. And this is just a really small segment of a larger presentation that we do. And uh, we'll be doing that at the advanced conference for CPOA later this year. So keep in mind and, and look for that. Um, I'll start off also, I'll give you a disclaimer. I'm not a clinician. Um, I'm not from you know, the background of academia. I'm just someone who's been around for a long time in law enforcement in this profession, who's learned a lot and has grown a lot through my experiences. So please um, you know, uh, just understand that I'm not a PhD. I don't have a master's degree. It's just somebody who uh, is coming to you from, from the field of, of being here and the school of hard knocks really. So we all understand that police suicide is a very difficult conversation to have. It's a serious topic. It's really affecting our profession right now. And it's something that we need to talk about. Getting those um, conversations out of the shadows and into the open is so important. Keep in mind though, also in law enforcement, we, we tend to use levity sometimes and some humor. So if something comes up today, we're making a joke, we're making, not making light of the situation. We're just trying to make uh, people understand that, that there is gotta be a little bit of humor to the things that we face. Otherwise, I think everything would, be, uh, would crumble down on us. And we do a great job of that in law enforcement. So uh, as we begin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen with you. And I'm hoping that this, you guys are able to see that. Is, is that working, Sean? Okay. Um, so this is a, a model that we put together. It's called the Astro model. And uh, you'll find out why we name it that in, in a little bit, but it's a seven point approach to a culture of wellness. And what we say is we're turning tragedy into hope. And, and this is a tragic story, but we're not just using that as a tragic story because all of us have been in law enforcement long enough. We've seen speakers talk about tragic stories and really, when you leave those, you don't have any resources and you're just sitting there going, wow, that was just a really sad story. And don't get me wrong, those are compelling stories to hear. But when you turn tragedy and use that into hope and to use it to something to move forward from, I think that's where um, the real successes come from. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, process and how we became uh, this model. And uh, at any time anybody has any questions, please feel free to stop me and, and do that. Uh, this works much easier if we are all engaging and I have to tell you, it's a little uncomfortable sitting behind and being tethered to a computer here. So I'm not used to uh, this format. So please uh, bear with any um, um, struggles that I may have by doing that. So we talk about law enforcement, like what's our primary purpose? Like what's the number one purpose why public safety is even in place? You know, you think about it, you have different answers from all over the country. Well, we're here to, you know, protect people and save lives, right? So Gordon Graham has put it to this, the number one reason why we're in um, business is the preservation of life. And that, that's number one. There's no second. That's what we do. So if there's an opportunity for us to save a life, that is the number one thing we do. Even in officer-involved shootings, right? What's the number one thing we do after that takes place? We try and preserve their life. So with that being said, externally, I, I think we do a great job of doing that. I mean, particularly now with the COVID and, and everything that's going on, all, you hear so much negativity, but there's some outstanding work that's being done. And also, it's, it's also being publicized. I mean, we got great stuff. There was somebody uh, yesterday grabbed a three-year-old baby, did CPR, saved the baby. I don't know if you saw that. Um, so there's outstanding work that's being done throughout our profession. But how are we doing internally? Internally, we don't do very well at all. Internally, we struggle. We struggle to identify these, uh, this problem, this this. Um, you know, the, um, the fear of, of sharing with somebody, the stigma, you know, all those things. So internally, we need something. We need some more. And I think that what we're seeing now in 2020 is, is a, a surge of people going, okay, I identified that we need to do something different. We're losing people left and right, and this profession needs something better. And I applaud everybody out there who's on the call now, but not just that, but who's out there doing something and being a solution and bringing uh, solutions to the table because we all can learn from each other. Every time I do one of these speaks, uh, I go around the country, I learn from each time. And each time I do a presentation, it's different because it goes with the, uh, the people that you're talking to um, uh, and the interactions that you get through these programs. And networking is, is the number one resource that we have in law enforcement. So 
feel free to reach out to each other. Uh, and hopefully Sean will have that information and we can share that of people that share today. So, um, so again, going back to this, this is the preservation of life is the number one thing. And internally, we definitely need help and, and we need people to help us do that. And this came from Gordon Graham. So what are we looking at with our current trends? I'm not a big stat guy, but I think this is important. Last year in 2019, we lost about 228 officers to suicide. And why do I say about? Well, I say about because there's really no formal way of collecting data. You know, Karen from Blue Help does a great job. She's kind of been um, the person that's been uh, formulating the data and getting it out to everybody. But really there's nothing in place now for a national database to take place. And why do I say approximately? Because those numbers are predicted to be underreported by a factor of 2.5. Listen to that stat, underreported by a factor of 2.5. So in your space where you are right now, and typically we're doing these in, in, a, in a venue where there's you know, a couple hundred people, but think about your space now with 500 people, over 500 officers standing in front of your uniform that died by their own hands. It's pretty alarming. And if there's anybody out there that doesn't see that there's a problem, then maybe we need to share with them a little bit more statistics. But with this number that I'm sharing with you today, this doesn't count retirees. It doesn't count our dispatchers. It doesn't count our crime scene techs. This is just officers alone. So think about those numbers that it's, it's alarming and it's an epidemic and I'm glad that we're all here together to find out a solution and we bring this forward and help each other combat this issue. So again, we're losing almost double the amount of officers to suicide than all other line of duty deaths combined. That means every officer that died uh, vehicularly, in shootings, uh, heart attacks. If you combine all those last year, and this is approximate numbers, 128 to 132 is the number and we're losing almost a double by their own hand? Do we not see that there's something we need to do? We're not doing things very well when we're losing officers at this alarming rate. That's why I implore anybody that's sitting out there, particularly supervisors, we need to do something. Come out of this, uh, um, this webinar and go back and do something different than you're, not, than you're doing today. Just bring something back to the organization. And later on, I'm, I'm not gonna like to hear what you have been doing because that will share with us and make us stronger as well. So already in 2020, 95 officers have died by their own hand, 95. And again, we don't have a great reporting system. So this may be even more so. And, I, and my um, estimation would be that this is a lot more than that. And particularly what we're seeing with the pandemic, uh, the civil unrest, these are all things that we're having right now. This is all gonna take a long-term effect on those numbers because there's officers right now that are struggling. Officers that have never seen um, uh, an environment where they're the victim, where they're now the demon. I mean, these are all things as us as leaders in this uh, profession need to be, understand. So COVID-19, the pandemic and civil unrest, these are all playing a part in what's going on and they're just gonna enhance our numbers. So we really need to be even more proactive in trying to bring something to our people to help them. So why is why is the pandemic, let's just take that by itself. Why is the pandemic cause such a big problem for us? Anybody? Well, the reason why is because when you're in, in a situation where you're struggling, uh, particularly maybe a mental health crisis, what's the worst thing that could happen? Isolation. So now you know, we all put ourselves in our own shoes. Like we go home and maybe we have families and, and we spend time with our families on the weekends, or maybe we have an opportunity you know, to spend time out you know, in nature, but you may have some single people that are struggling right now that go home to an empty apartment, an empty house, and that's all they do. They can't go out and they do that. So this is just gonna ex uh, exasperate the situation that we place our people in. And we have to be aware of that. And that's why we have to be so proactive now and not just stop by in the hallway and ask somebody if they're okay, but actually stop, talk to them, look in the eye and say, are you okay? And really mean that, you know, create that environment. So typically what I do at this point, I ask people to take out their cell phones. Um, obviously that's not gonna work in this environment. Um, so what I'm gonna ask if you could do is everybody have the thumbs up button. If you know how to use that, that would be helpful. So what I'm gonna ask is if anybody out there in your organization has had somebody who died by suicide, hit your thumbs up. And I have a hard time seeing all these screens, but maybe Sean can give us. So keep, keep that going, keep that up. 
And anybody who has personally knows somebody who has died by suicide, hit your thumbs up. And that'll be, for a lot of folks, that'll be in your reactions button um, toward where you see participants and things. Your reactions should have the, the thumbs up or thumbs down or um, the clap okay. button. So think of, I'm sorry, I hit my uh, button, but so go back and think also. So you got the people who have died by suicide. I've seen a lot of thumbs up. People who personally know somebody who died by suicide. And then my last question is, and this is also to keep our thumbs up, anybody who knows somebody who's currently struggling in your organization that may need assistance, hit your thumbs up. And I'd imagine, Sean, maybe you could help me, but I imagine there's a lot of thumbs up or have come up through this process. So that's why this is so important. And the reason why I do this in a large, in a large venue when we put our cell phones, because by the time those three questions are asked, the entire room is lit. The entire room is lit with, with uh, cell phone lights on. And it it's, doesn't have the effect here, but I think anybody can understand and see the thumbs up that are going on, that this affects everybody. And I, my hand up would be for each one of those. You know, I've been in organizations where people have died by suicide. I know personally someone who died by suicide, more than one person. And then per, certainly I could probably identify people in the organization that are struggling right now, particularly with the pandemic, the civil unrest. Um, how about the calls to defund the police departments? All that um, unsettledness for especially new officers coming out of the academy. Defunding, what do you think that means to them? Maybe their lifelong dream now will be ended because there won't be enough funding for them to come on board. Um, so, and attempts to billionize our, you know, our um, profession. You know, one, at one minute we're, we're heroes and the next minute we're, we're, um, we're the demons and, and we're the, uh, we're the uh, cause of all the hate. So, we have to understand that that environment really creates pressure on our organization and our employees. So, but at work, we all know we, we tend to mask, right? We, we tell everybody, I'm fine, I'm doing okay. But when, when does it really hit us? Is usually when we, when we go home and uh, when we're able to take off that, you know, that vest and that mask that we wear every day. So it's important to understand that. Um, and, and again, nothing is worse than someone who's struggling than isolation. And we'll share a little bit more about that. So isolate, isolation and despair are two of the things that our officers are going through right now, or I should say, I should say our employees. Um, so with all this civil unrest, it, it's, it's a major concern. And I think, unfortunately, we're gonna see some really bad outcomes later on this year. So why are we here talking about this? We're talking about officer wellness. So the way I, I've kind of looked at it is that officer wellness is really at the center of everything that we do, right? It's kind of the core of who we are. It's kind of our heart and everything that we do. And when we have a, an opportunity to interact in, in a different environment, we ask people to kind of give, um, you know, offsprings of what officer wellness, like what affects officer wellness. So I kind of created this model and I'll share with everybody. So here's just some of the things that affect officer wellness. So do you think that uh, an off, uh, someone's conduct at work, if they're having poor conduct, doesn't relate to their officer wellness? Of course it does. How about their performance? Have you seen somebody who has had really bad performance or have seen the decline of performance and you go back and you find out what the real core is and what the, what's going on? It's, it's officer wellness, right? It's their health, it's their, their uncertainty, their whatever may be going on, right? How about recruitment and retention? All these things, relationships, attitude, morale, everything comes back to officer wellness. So when you hear some people, maybe some of the people that we are following as far as leaders in our organizations, you know, back then, officer wellness wasn't a big issue, but it really was. It just wasn't identified because all these things, I think you could show that officer wellness is in the center and in the core of almost everything we do in law enforcement. That's why it's so important that we're here today and we're going to talk about these things. So um, 8,000 law enforcement um, FOP members were surveyed uh, back in 2018. And they said overwhelmingly, they report that stress on the job has impacted their mental health. You know, it's 90% of them said that stigma was a barrier to getting help, meaning they were afraid to say anything. Am I going to get put to a rubber gun squad? Am I going to be, you know, set to light duty? Am I going to be set for, set off for a uh, unfit for duty test? 85% worried about that, appearing unfit to their organization. And then everybody goes, well, we have EAP, we don't need anything else. Well, 59% who used EAP found it unhelpful. And the, and the numbers are, go um, down from there when we talk about, um, separating these out a little bit. And so that's alarming. So what are we doing as law enforcement leaders? If we know these are stats and they're not, um, they're not secret to everybody, so what are we doing for our people? 
if we know they're not going to go to EAP, we know they're not going to share these um, events with anybody because they're in fear of being considered unfit or stigma, what are we doing? So that brings me to uh, Asher Rosinski. And this is Asher, and this is where the name comes from. So let me tell you about um, Asher. It's like three o'clock in the morning, and I get a phone call from a guy in my squad who, who's screaming, he's crying. And he says, Asher is dead. Asher is dead. And then he repeats one more time. He says, Asher is dead. It's like three o'clock in the morning. And, you know, back in the 90s, I don't know, most of you probably know that there was, cell, there was phones that weren't cell phones. So when one phone rang, the entire house rang. So it woke everybody up. And I'm just sitting there and I go, I couldn't even comprehend what he was talking about. Well, Asher was a hardworking guy. So I figured he was out on off-duty job, you know, working an off-duty job and, and got into, you know, an incident where, you know, we put our lives on the line. That's what we do in law enforcement. But then he, he tells me, he says, no, Asher killed himself. And I just couldn't really, it really didn't hit home. I, I didn't even know how to respond to that. You know, and back in those days, I mean, we didn't have, you know, the, there was no landscape like we have now. There was no peer support. Um, you know, there was no EAP programs. No one talked about these things. I mean, there was actually just no support whatsoever. But the most profound thing happened to me was directly after that time and it affected my life and it affected my career. And that was, we went back to work the next day and, and you know what happened? No one talked about it. Um, we were told to go 10-8. Uh, we were told that when we decide um, when the funeral services will be held, you'll know about it. And you were just sent off to the road. Um, no resources, we weren't able to talk about it. There was absolutely nothing uh, in place for us to help you know, people that were struggling with dealing with Asher's death. And what was really sad about this situation was Asher was uh, of the Jewish faith and uh, he ended up dying by suicide on a Thursday. Well, in that faith, in the Jewish faith, you need to be uh, laid to rest before the Sabbath on a Friday. So one day later, after you find out about the death of our friend, we're at the funeral. So do you think there was, um, you know, uh, you know, a bunch of cars and a bunch of uh, fanfare about this? No, nothing. Um, we weren't even invited into the small little cemetery that was there. Um, and so we were outside while they were having a service for our buddy, our friend, a guy who I went to the academy with and, and a guy who uh, I was in his wedding. So then they take his body afterwards and it's in a casket and he brings it out to um, the place where he's going to be laid to rest. And I didn't really think about this at the time, but now I think about it and I thought about it many years later. They laid in the rest and it really didn't really um, impact me, but I didn't realize there was a huge mound of dirt next to his burial ground. And I'm like, well, I wonder why they did that, why they didn't hide that, why they didn't throw something over and drape over it. And what they proceeded to do is they, did, they proceeded to lower Asher into the ground. And then one by one, we all took a shovel and actually physically buried our buddy. One by one, we walked up, grabbed shovelfuls of dirt and threw it on top of our, our friend. And then you don't think that's impactful? If you think that radio call, which they did afterwards, was impactful, if you ever listened to that before, standing there putting dirt and watching your buddy's coffin getting covered by dirt with you are the ones shoveling the dirt on top of him will affect you the rest of your life and you'll never forget it. And I'm telling you right now, to this day, I, I remember that day. So, you know, again, I can go into this and, and it goes into a much deeper story, but I'm gonna move on due to time. But we could use that as a sad story and kind of just live with that, or we could take that, grow from it and figure out what we can do to say, no more ashes. We are not gonna allow our friends to die by suicide. We are just not gonna allow that anymore. We're not gonna tolerate it anymore. And what we did is we decided to turn this tragedy into hope. And we created this Asher model. And I'm hoping everybody can see that. Sean, can they see that? So I'll go through this fairly quickly because I know we're kind of short on time. But so we figured, okay, what are we going to do? You know, what can we do for our people? You know, yoga works for some people. That's great. Deep breathing works for some people. That's great. Some people that it's not effective for. So we said, okay. Well, the research we did, I went to New York, I was at the PERP Symposium in April, and everybody says, you need to have a multifaceted approach to be able to help your people. Because what, one, what would work with one person may not work for another. So we designed this. 
And I'll go through the points. And the reason why it's seven points is it kind of just fits into the Bay Area badge that we have here. Um, but I have people have reached out to me out the country and they've used this as well. And they've used their own image on um, the, the badge here and they put their own shield on it. So I'll automatically tell you, um, there's nothing proprietary here. Feel free to take this, use this model, um, use your own verbiage if you want. I don't care if you just take your badge or your patch and stick it on there and use it. But if you want it, then use it. But we figured out the number one thing that you have to do before anything else could be effective is what? Creating an environment of it's okay to not be okay. Now that's a popular term now, but a year or two ago, two ago that wasn't a very popular term. But it's so important to have those conversations. And it can't be just be a program you throw out. It's gotta be something that the chiefs believe in, your leaders in your organization believe in. Because if I just say it's okay to not be okay, but I don't share my personal story, there's not a whole lot of buy-in that comes with that. So again, creating those discussions, having open and honest discussions with these people and bringing these conversations out of the shadows and into the open. It's so important. And really there's no other program that could work unless this is your foundation. So then we decided to go, okay, well, what are we gonna do besides just create an environment? And we said, well, you know what? We're gonna have a solution focused approach. We're gonna be proactive with this. And we started researching some things. And for our agency, and there's many of different um, platforms out there, there's several different app platforms that are out there. We decided that um, Cortico Shield was the best app for us. But like I said, I, I don't want, I don't work for Cortico. I don't get paid by Cortico, but I do believe in, in their product and I believe it's second to none. However, there are very, uh, there's several other products out there that, that do a great job as well. But it's and why it's so important is that it gives people resources 24-7, 365 in their hands. You know, powerful resources to find out what PTSD means. They can take self-assessments. They can call hotlines. Um, they can read about articles about PTSD. They can read about articles about um, alcoholism. And it's just a one-stop shop to get these resources into our, our officers' hands. And why we think that's important and, and why it's so important is that, you know, at two, three in the morning, when an officer you know, gets it, maybe um, an altercation with their spouse and they're driving around and, and they just think there's nowhere else to go and they've been drinking and they have a firearm in their hand, I don't want them to have to wait on hold somewhere for uh, someone to answer a call. They have these resources right in their hand and they're able to do that. One of the keys to this is everything that they do is confidential and anonymous. And our research has shown that if it's not confidential, anonymous, people are gonna be reluctant to use it. So that's why it's so important. They can get therapists from this. There's a, a therapist uh, that are vetted that are used to working in law enforcement. So it's so important that the right people get to see our people. Because sometimes if you send them to the wrong therapist, you really could damage uh, any type of relationship in the future. So again, number two would be solution-focused solution approach. So three is peer support, and, and there's many organizations out right now that have peer support, and, which is great. And I think that's so important. And they say that peer support is one of the most important things you could do right now for your people. So you wanna create a proactive peer support team. And when I mean proactive, like we have our dispatchers that are on peer support. They don't wait for someone to say, hey, we think you should reach out to Bob or Mike because they had a, a critical incident. If they see something that may be something that could rise to the level where they may need some help, we're sending texts now. We're reaching out to them. Hey, I'm here if you need anything. I'm here if uh, you got any questions. Here's resources for you. Don't forget about your app. So really being proactive and not waiting for that quote unquote big one to kick in or wait for that critical incident debrief to get involved. These people are very, very well uh, versed at interacting. And one of the keys for us with our selection process is get people that are gonna be well liked and, and well respected by the peers, don't let your admin pick them. Myself as a chief, I should be picking the peer support people because who I may think may be a great peer support person, people may not even ever want to talk to them or approach them. So make that part of your selection process. The other thing is too, is to teach people about CISM. And we also added a police dog therapy program. And you would think that's for the community, but I'm telling you, we've used that way more internally for our people than we have externally. It's a very, very effective program. And it's really not that cost, um, uh, it's not that, not that restrictive due to cost. You can get things done. There are dogs out there that are uh, available through programs. So the fourth thing we talk about is resiliency. And that's really about education, right? Educating your people on what resiliency is. Um, mindfulness, you know, your, 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 your tactical breathing, um, your emotional intelligence, train them on, on what PTSD and what that looks like. 
uh, train them on what the difference between PTSD is and PTSI, you know, two separate things that we always trying to use synonymously. Um, and, and again, bring these things, find training. And I don't, you know, with the budget cuts that are there, there's plenty of resources out. LinkedIn has resources. All of us probably in this room could share resources. I, there are some people in the room now that I'm looking at that I have reached out to before for some of these resources. So right now there's a, a ton of people, um, you know, diving into this wellness pool. So there's a plenty of resources out there. Just make sure you vet them, make sure they're quality people. So the fifth one is, is healthy habits. And when we talk about healthy habits, what do we talk about? You know, working out. Well, that's typically what we talk about, but we gotta talk about everything. Encourage physical fitness, encourage healthy habits when it comes to food, everything. Uh, what we did, we updated our, our fitness program and then we created a program where they can work out on duty because really it, it's, it's so important that they have an ability to de-stress and, and lower their cortisol, cortisol levels by working out and, and being able to have that avenue to be able to do that. Where many of the officers, when they go home, they have kids to take care of, they have families to take care of, they don't have time to work out. So we create that environment here and it's really not that big of a lift to try and get that um, into a program in, in your organization. One other thing that we did also is we went around to our, um, our, our um, vending machines and we started taking everything out of there that's unhealthy. Now, by no stretch of the imagination, do I, by anybody think you could get a healthy meal out of a vending machine? But certainly when you start making those little changes, you start getting healthier options in there, people start to buy, buy into it. And then they don't have the options to buy those candy bars and things like that. So think about those things. And there's one other thing that this was created about a year ago, but that's really important now. And there's some actual um, doctors, you know, that are actually helping with cardiac type of testing before they get into law enforcement and during law enforcement. Uh, there's a guy named Dr. Ben Stone, who's out of Texas, who's uh, an advocate for this and has a great program. Um, so just think about those things. So we got to think about our cardio, uh, our cardiac health. We got to talk about our physical fitness. And of course, healthy eating habits uh, is so important. And then some people get a little bit, um, you know, a little bit scared to talk about spirituality, but, you know, I can tell you that developing a police clergy coalition has been big for our organization. You know, when, when something happens, we can bring in these clergy members to, to help us out and help work through some problems. And then um, a very good chaplain program, uh, embedding your chaplains into what you're doing, not make it just a program, but make it really embed them into your program, make them a fabric of your organization where when they come to ride with somebody, it's not, hey, why are they riding with Joe today? Like they're just used to seeing the chaplain around and they're used to seeing them embedded in your program um, where they're riding with people on a constant basis. They come to the PD, they're not you know, uh, invited because of a meeting, but they're just around the police department. And I think that's really, really important. And we've seen a lot of success through our chaplain programs. And then we started something with our community and it's not for everybody, but we do something on Monday where we meet with all denominations, everybody's invited, and we do something with pray with the police. And we pray for our profession, we pray for our city, and we pray for um, our community. And again, that's been very, very successful. And, and again, that won't work in every community. So uh, and it's been very good here. One of the keys to this program, and how am I doing on time, Sean? Good, we, we started a few minutes with, you know, some, some sponsor remarks. So I think you're, you're good for a few more minutes, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, seven, I think, is, is something that um, if you've been in law enforcement, like particularly when I started in the, you know, the 80s, uh, we never incorporated family to anything that we did. You know, I, my spouses or, or spouses, sorry, my spouse, who no longer is a spouse, but um, and my family members, they never came to the police department. You know, they were there maybe the day I got sworn in and that was it. But they weren't part of our organization. So now we involve our families. Uh, the new hires particularly, into the orientation process moving forward. We bring them in. Uh, we provide an officer wellness library. They can take, take books out of that library. Officers could share that with their families. Uh, when we do the orientation process, typically on the day we do the swearing in process. So we split our families up and one goes through our uh, shoot, no shoot uh, training scenarios so they could see what that's like and what their employee, I mean, what their family members are going to go through. And then we take them through and we give them a tour of the police department. What does the police department even look like? So they know when I said, hey, I was sitting in briefing, now I can visualize what my spouse was doing or what my family member was doing today. And then of course, um, I meet with them individually and I share with them what this career is gonna be like. And I tell them, hey, this, this is a difficult career and you're gonna see changes in your loved ones. And then I provide every single family, emotional survivor for law enforcement, Kevin Gilmartin. 
It's a great book. It's a short read. It's a very, very good resource to, to give them. And then the last thing I ask them to do is to be an advocate for us. Because when the employees are going to come to work, they're going to mask their, their emotions. They're going to mask how they're feeling. But who's going to be the ones who identify red flags? Is it going to be the law enforcement supervisors? Probably not. It's going to be the family members. So encouraging them to you know, uh, be that advocate for us. And if you see a red flag, please call us and let us know. And then the last thing we do before we, we send them off to their, uh, the ceremony to watch their loved ones get sworn in, we give them, uh, um, they're able to download the Cortical app. So now the spouse or the family members have that app as well. And there's resources in there for them as well so they can understand what their family member is going through throughout this career. So again, I'm not saying that you know, um, peer support is going to work for everybody, or maybe you know, healthy habits is going to work for everybody. But my hope is that when you present a multifaceted approach to your people, one of these points is going to hit home. And really, if one point hits home and changes an outcome, then we've done our job. And really, that's all this is about, changing outcomes and making sure that we're able to uh, bring solutions to our employees who really deserve it. I'm going to move forward here. So this is Asher's um, widow, Lisa. So before I start this, I want to talk to you a little about this. When we developed the Asher model, um, it was uh, somehow it just really went viral. It got picked up by a lot of major um, uh, law enforcement uh, networks and it was out there. And one day I, I get a call and I'm sitting in my office and my uh, administrative assistant comes in and goes, hey, Asher from, I mean, excuse me, Lisa from South Florida is on the phone. And I'm like, okay, Lisa from South Florida? I go, uh, I've been out of there, what, about 20 years, Lisa, I don't know who that is. I'm not calling that back. So I'm like, eh, it's just, a, I got a little nervous about that. I go, can you call this person back and get a little bit more information than Lisa from South Florida? So she does, and she says, it's, it's Lisa Brzezinski. She wants to talk to you. So I pick up the phone, and I call Lisa, and I go, and I, I'm waiting, really, honestly, to, for her to yell at me for saying, hey, you know, how, do you, how are you using my husband's name? I mean, I didn't get permission to do any of that stuff. And, and really, it's just her, it's just so thankful that her husband's name didn't die in vain, that somebody is doing something with this tragedy and trying to change our profession and do something positive with it. And uh, so I asked her if she minded uh, putting together just a short video, kind of um, impacts uh, us as law enforcement. And this is what's important, is that our people need to hear this. Our people need to hear from the survivors you know, because when they take their own life, there's nothing more powerful than listen to the mom and dad to say how it, impact, how it impacted them and changed their life forever. But maybe, maybe just hearing a story like this will change their, um, their outcome and change what they do in the future. So I'm going to play this for you. Hi, my name is Lisa Rosinski. Sorry I couldn't be there with you today. I lost my husband, Asher Rosinski, to suicide 22 years ago. My husband was a police officer just like you in Pembroke Pines, Florida. I was suddenly left alone then to raise two very young children, Matthew, age three, and Sean, who was only 13 months old. When a peace officer dies in the line of duty, the department makes a big deal out of it, as they should. But when they lose someone to suicide, they treat it as very matter of fact. He was the first person in his department to die by suicide. No one knew what to say or do. The entire force came to his funeral, of course, but most of them disappeared after that, leaving me virtually alone while they went on with their lives. My life changed in an instant that day and I was left with so much doubt. What could I have done? What should I have done? And what would I do now? Life as we knew it would never be the same for my kids his and my family, and especially me. That is why I think it is so important that you spread the word and promote the Asher model to all your departments. Chief Gang has done an amazing, proactive seven-point approach to creating a culture of wellness to educate, offer support, and give solutions to those in need before it is too late. This incredible and important program offers resources Asher and I never had, solutions that may help prevent suicides and avoid a tragic event from ever happening. Chief Gang and I will soon be collaborating on a new project that addresses the aftermath of suicide 
and the impact on survivors when the unthinkable happens. Stay tuned and thank you for listening. So I want to touch on, on something that um, Lisa said, uh, and, it, and I really go into it a lot more in, in the, um, the, the full presentation. But so again, do you remember back when I said, so Asher died on a Thursday, we buried him on a Friday. Lisa got a phone call on Monday afternoon and told her that you no longer have insurance with our, with our company. She wasn't working at the time, two young children, that Monday, and she remembers this vividly, that phone call. The other thing that really, really was impactful for me to hear is no one stopped by her anymore. Like, I don't remember going over there afterwards because we're so, you know, I don't know what to say, right? We get so uncomfortable with, I don't know what to say or I don't know what to do. But you know what, it, it's time we all step up and go, you know what, we need to be uncomfortable being uncomfortable because that is just not right. Here's a guy who gave his life to the organization. And within, you know, she said a few weeks, he never heard from anybody ever again. And, it, and it's sad. Back then, and I'll share a little bit of the story, but back then uh, we did our own investigation. Pembroke Pines is in South Florida, uh, about now uh, about a 275 man department, about 154,000 people. So uh, we did their own investigation and the detectives talked to her and said, hey, we will get back to you. 22 years, 22 years later, now 23 years later, she's never heard from a detective, not one time, not once. How did they, how did the investigation conclude? What happened? What did you find out? Not one time. It, we, we had to do better. And now as we move up, you know, and we're leaders in the profession, we need to do better for people like this. And anybody who's struggling, who may even in the inkling of wanting to hurt themselves and take their own lives needs to hear more stories like this. So maybe, just perhaps, it will change their outcome. So I'm gonna pass through some of this because I know we're, we're getting short on time, but again, things to consider when we close out here is, do you have a policy in place in your organization that even deals with police suicide? Many of us don't. I think many of us have Lexapol. I don't think we have anything in there. No, do you do statewide not notification or you just do that locally? That's important. How do you handle that in social media? So these are all things that you wanna kind of vet out now before that event takes place. So you're not making those decisions when you're so emotional. Do you authorize morning bands for your department? Many departments say that morning bands are only authorized for in the line of duty deaths. Is this considered in the line of duty deaths? Again, these are all conversations that we can have, but something that you should bring back to your organizations and talk about now. Funeral arrangements, do you do full honors? How do you, how do you treat one of these, these incidences, these tragedies. Do you give full honors? Does that take away from the other officers who did die in line duty that, that maybe uh, feel slighted if you did that? Things to think about. Things to try and vet out now before, again, that tragic day comes. So here's something we developed. This is called an Asher coin. Um, we developed these and I, I donate them out. And what this does is it's not just a coin. But maybe, I'm just hoping that one day when you go back to your organizations and you say, hey, I had this coin, and I apologize, I can't distribute any now, but typically in my presentations, I'll give one out. And you go back to your organization and you talk to somebody and say, you're not going to go back and say, hey, I just, met, I just listened to this guy talk about police suicide. Um, you know, how do you feel about that? But now you can go back and er, cops love shiny things, right? They love black, shiny things. So here's a coin. You can go, hey, look at this cool coin I got. And maybe just this is gonna be a, star, a conversation starter and an icebreaker, and that's all we're asking, is if you have the opportunity to share those conversations with your people, open up, share what you have, and maybe this can start that off to you to be that icebreaker and that conversation starter. Uh, Sean, I'll, I'll stop here for some Q&A and then I got a, a final. And, and again, I'm, I'm sorry for getting through this real short. Sorry for cutting some of the concepts short. And uh, I look forward to sharing a lot more at the advanced uh, presentation coming up. And of course, uh, I'm available at any time for anybody to call. Thanks, Chief, I, I appreciate it. I wanna follow, use as a, as a question that I have, a follow up to what you mentioned kind of towards the very beginning about needing to do a better job, you know, internally. Um, it, so as I mentioned in my introduction, traditionally the last few years for CPOA, I've liaised to, to our regions. And when I go and talk to some of our regions, I was out in the Santa Cruz area and talking to some folks out there. And there was a discussion about 
you know, do, what about a CPOA class on, on this and wellness and everything like that? And a lot of the discussion tend, tended to be, yeah, the supervisors, the command staff, we, we would love it, but look, but good luck getting our land level, our land level guys to go to it because there, I think there is that stigma behind it or lack of resources or, or motivation from that. So I'm curious from, from you or from anyone on the, uh, in the attendees and, and um, even not just statewide, uh, I think nationwide too. So I, I believe it's Edward Cunningham. So I hate to put you on the spot, sir, but I think you're tuning in from Elizabethtown, which I think is Kentucky. I know there's quite a few Elizabeth towns, but I'm curious to see what some other folks, what, what you've done that's been successful, whether you do, you do mention some of this stuff in roll call and briefing, or, or is it a separate kind of thing? Uh, Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, thank you. Um, I'm curious if, if you have a thought, sir, or um, Edward, or, or anyone on the line from your agency, um, I'd just be curious to see what, what some folks have done to deal with this issue in other areas. So Edward, are you able to unmute yourself and, and chat? We'd love to hear from you. If not, I'll turn it back over to Chief Gang or anyone else to answer that question. All right, maybe not. Uh, it looks like you'd have to call in. Uh, anyone else uh, on the from the attendees? I know the chief wants to hear from you too. What are some things you've been doing at your at your level to kind of close this out? Peer support couple, raised a hand, go ahead. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Hi, Javier Bustos from that peer support couple. Uh, I think the, the main thing that's important for everyone, regardless of where you are in the nation, is to just create the awareness mm -hmm. and have the conversations with your departments. That's what's most important. If they see from the top level on down uh, to your youngest officer that the conversations are not taboo, that they can be had and it's coming from the top level, there's gonna be a quicker acceptance throughout your whole department, your whole agency that people can talk about this. And when there's that conversation, you're gonna hopefully catch some of the officers or deputies uh, or troopers, uh, federal agents the case may be, that they may be going through a hard time and knowing that there is acceptance, knowing that there isn't gonna be a stigma attached to them speaking up is very valuable to get the conversation started and to actually get people the help that they need. Yeah, I appreciate that, thank you. Any other final thoughts or questions from attendees? If, if not, we'll turn it back over to the chief. Any, anything final? So I know from from Elizabethtown PA that he mentioned they're going to be, this came in through the chat here, that they're going to be including, um, you know, baseline mental health evaluations, create a yearly check-in to evaluate mental wellness. Uh, the union president and, and uh, Edward both speak very openly about the struggles with PTSI. So we, we seek, you know, regularly encourage officers to seek that help. I think there is that kind of, you know, it's okay to be not okay and to, it's okay to ask for help. So that's, that's good to know. Um, so that came from, uh, from Pennsylvania. So um, Chief, I'll turn it back over to you to close this out, sir. Great. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the people inputting it. I know this is a difficult forum to do that. So it's difficult to have difficult conversations unless you can see somebody and really interact with them. So we apologize, but we, we felt it was important to get this out. I, I think Javier hit it right that if you're top line uh, supervisor in your organization, and I'm going to say, I always have this term, if not me, then who? So if I'm not going to have that conversation, and I'm not going to start that, that program or I'm not gonna have those difficult conversations, then how can I expect anybody else to do that? Then it can, again, then it becomes just a checkbox program for your organization. And that's the last thing we want for this. That our people deserve better and we deserve to be able to provide them better. And again, it has to stop with, it has to start with us, the senior people in law enforcement. And then again, uh, Sean, you brought up a good point about bringing this into training. I think every academy needs to have this, this brought in. Uh, we're, we're trying to reach out to academies now, make this a part of what they're doing. We're reaching out to Cal Post to be able to do these things. But I think I don't think that there should be academy classic graduates without hearing something in this realm of officer wellness and, and what they're going to be facing, number one, but also get, provide them the resources before the job even starts, particularly in all the things that we're seeing now, with the civil unrest, 
and society and this, this pandemic that everybody's going through. So I, I think that was a great point that uh, Javier brought up. So I, I'm gonna encourage everybody to, to go back and create the culture. You know, it, it, again, it starts with us. Uh, if, it, if not you, then who? Be the solution. Don't wait for a solution to come out. Be the solution, bring back some things. And again, many of these things we talked about today, and I'll be more, more than happy to talk offline, don't take any budget at all. It just takes um, a little bit of wherewithal, a little bit of perseverance, and you can get things done. I think if we all to get together and do these things, we can come together and, and create an environment where we can stop police suicide. And then I ask you all, let's join together. Let's start a movement because not one person is going to be able to stop this. We need to come together as a brotherhood, a sisterhood, get together and, and do something more today than we did yesterday to stop this from occurring. So and again, I think if we do all these things, we'll come together and we'll be able to change outcomes. And that's what we're here for. And if we come out of this, if we go back and change one thing, and we change one person's decision not to take their own life, then our job is done. And this was all worth, wealth, wealth, well worth the effort that we put into it. And then lastly, I'm just going to invite you to do is stay health, stay safe, stay healthy, stay resilient. And then I encourage everybody to you know, get on LinkedIn. Please friend me on LinkedIn. Um, let's uh, let's in, incorporate resources. We can network together. And there's a ton of resources out there. And if you ever feel alone, just reach out because there's, again, there's somebody is doing something that you're looking for. Someone will have the answer for you. And, and again, uh, thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for this opportunity. And uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to share with everybody. And thank you, Chief. And thank you for everyone for tuning in. I, I put the link to the to the Cortico blog uh, in the chat box. So uh, feel free to you know, click on that and bring some of that back to your agency. But again, um, any additional information that you uh, would like, reach out to us at CPOA and, and certainly reach out to, to Chief Gang for that. But um, we definitely you know, uh, appreciate everyone uh, tuning in and hearing some of these things and having this conversation. Because I know in speaking, putting my legislative hat on and my advocacy hat, I know when I speak to a lot of legislators in the Capitol, they talk about, oh, you, police need to get away from this macho mentality and everything else. And it's like, no, that's not, that's pushed by you. you there, we're all human beings here. These are human beings that we represent that, you know, deal, deal with these things. And we want to give you all the resources before you see and hear and, and smell what you have to deal with. You know, so I think that the chief's uh, point about getting it in the academies and other things right up front. Uh, is key and something hopefully CPOA can can help in that endeavor. But uh, again, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thanks Chief Gang for your time. And um, we hope everyone uh, stay safe and, and uh, especially during these times and all your folks uh, stay resilient and uh, CPOA is here to help. So thanks everyone and uh, have a good rest of the day.